What do we mean by the word normal? Look it up in the dictionary and you'll usually find two definitions, both of which can be used as nouns or adjectives. Normal is the typical, standard, expected, almost commonly found state or condition. Or it is a line, plane, trajectory or other linear feature which is at right angles or 90 degrees to another linear feature. But are those definitions sufficient to describe the way we use the word when we apply it to people? What exactly is normal? When you're autistic, the words normal and abnormal are ones we hear all too often, and they can be difficult words to hear. Even those of us who find out they're autistic in adulthood or middle age have long lived with the understanding that normal was something other people were, but not them. Autists hear it endlessly, sometimes with malicious intent, though more often than not without any thought being given to its impact whatsoever. Normal has an aspirational quality to it. Some people want to be rich, some to be famous, others strive for peace and harmony, and a select few wish in their heart of hearts to be Disney princesses. But above and beyond all other ambitions and desires, almost the entire neurotypical world wants to be normal. Normal is quite easy to understand when we describe non-human items or systems. It would be accurate of me to say, for instance, that it's normal for mammals to have lungs, breathe air and be warm-blooded. Every mammal we know of, even aquatic mammals, conforms to those rules. I might even get away with saying it's normal for mammals to have four legs, because whilst whales, dolphins and porpoises all have flippers and fins where they once had legs, the majority of known mammals live on land and do indeed have four legs, or two legs, plus two adapted into arms. If I said it was normal for mammals to lay eggs, I'd be rightly challenged though. Only two of the thousands of known species of mammal lay eggs, the duckbill platypus and the echidna. It's easy to apply the dictionary definition of normal to factual, objectively measurable statements. One can provide proof of their truth beyond any reasonable doubt. If I were to look outside of my window in February to see cold grey skies and rain, I could say that the weather was normal for the time of year. I live in the UK and February is the middle of winter, so I'd be making a true verifiable statement. But what about if I lived in Australia? February is summertime in Australia, so if I were to say the same whilst looking out of a window in Adelaide or Melbourne, nobody would agree with me. My perspective on what weather is normal for the time of year would be different based on my location. I have a physical disability which affects my mobility. Every six months I go for a checkup with a rheumatologist, and every three months I have my medicine delivered for me, all for no charge. I can go to see my GP if I fall sick or have other health concerns too. Since everybody in the UK can do the same, pay for out of our taxes and national insurance, that is normal to me. But many of my friends overseas have to worry about affording the same treatments or even have to struggle without. Some of them cannot even work to pay taxes because they have the same disability as I do but have no money for treatment that might allow them enough mobility and freedom from pain to go to work. Although they live in different countries, it's not geography that makes our perception of what is normal for healthcare so different. It isn't a natural phenomenon such as weather. It's a political decision, a purely human influence. If I grew up in India as a Hindu, I could consider it quite normal for other people to be Hindu too. Almost four in every five people in India is Hindu. However, in the UK, I would be in a minority. The majority of people in the UK are not Hindu. According to the 2011 UK census, only 1.5% of the population identify as Hindu, so I would be outnumbered by a huge margin. Statistically, I'd be only one of every 66 people or so. Yet to my perspective, following the Hindu faith would seem quite normal. 
my parents, grandparents and siblings would also most likely be Hindu too. Because of the way communities form, it's likely that I would have a number of Hindu friends, and so my perception of normal would be based on my personal experience, not on the statistical prevalence of Hindu people in the country I live. Now, if I were to take the word normal in the same sense we do when we talk about factual statistics and use it to refer to Hindu people as abnormal, I would be on very shaky moral ground. If I were to base my perception of normal on that same 2011 census, I'd see that around 60% of people identified as Christian. So I could call that normal. A quarter of the population said they followed no religion. One in four. I might get away with calling that normal too. It may not be the majority, but it's still statistically relevant. But describing a Hindu as abnormal because their religious beliefs were in a minority would be morally wrong. It'd be perfectly correct from a dry empirical point of view, but it would not be socially acceptable or morally justifiable to describe someone as abnormal for their religious beliefs. There is a third meaning to the word normal that isn't listed in the dictionaries. The word now has an emotionally charged meaning that can cause pain, division and even violence. Our ideas of what the word normal means and in which situations we can use it has been warped by cognitive bias. Normal and abnormal are no longer objective terms when we apply them to people, yet they are used in everyday conversation without any concern for how they affect the people around us. We have become a society in which normal no longer means in the majority. It means looks like me, thinks like me, behaves like me or shares the same beliefs as me. We judge others by our personal ideals, the environments and the people we surround ourselves with, not by measurable metrics. And as such, the terms normal and abnormal are no longer the objective words listed in the dictionary. They are entirely subjective. They're not verifiable facts, but opinions. And the factors which shape those opinions are sometimes ugly. I'm in a minority because I'm autistic and I have a great many autistic friends. It's common for autistic people to have intense interests and encyclopedic knowledge of those interests. When I talk to my autistic friends, we go to great lengths to ensure we're properly understood. So we might launch into long explanations of the point we're trying to make, giving detailed backgrounds and explaining laterally connected issues that play a small part in the overall picture. When we make decisions, we often spend time weighing up all the pros and cons of every outcome, not just life-changing ones like buying a house or whether to accept a particular job, but what to have for dinner or which TV series to start watching. All those behaviours are what, in my world, I consider to be normal. When I talk to autistic friends, I'm never surprised at how much they know about their chosen topics, even if those topics don't interest me much. And it doesn't bother me when they talk to me for 20 minutes or so explaining something to me. I actually quite enjoy it. I know that I'm prone to doing the same, so I would be a hypocrite if I didn't listen. Plus, I usually find what they have to say interesting. What happens when I talk to somebody in the same way, outside of autistic social circles? Quite often, I'll have barely started before someone starts to display signs of getting bored. And before long, they'll try to interrupt me. If I should say I haven't finished, they'll come back with, Can't you let somebody else speak for a minute? You always go on and on about stuff we're not interested in. Just get to the point like normal people. When I'm taking my time to decide on something, I've been told, It's not normal to think about things so much. Just make your mind up. And I've lost count of the times I've been told to cheer up because I don't look as excited as someone else thinks is normal. The best estimates we have at the moment suggest that autistic people make up between 3 and 5% of the population. That puts us at around 1 in 30 to 1 in 20. We are a minority for sure. As a minority, it seems OK in the purely objective statistical sense to say we're not normal. But it's not morally or socially OK. It would not be OK to tell a Hindu that their religion is abnormal. It's not OK to tell someone with red hair that they're abnormal because they're in a minority. Nor would it be fair to tell a person that their political beliefs were abnormal 
just because they were in a group of people who thought differently. It ceases to be a mere statement of statistical relativity and becomes an emotional value judgment. It is aggression. Normal and abnormal are not objective scientific terms when used in a human context. They are either inclusive or they are exclusionary. When you tell someone that they are not normal, you're not making a statement about their mathematical status as a minority. You're telling them that they do not meet your acceptable standards of humanity. You actively devalue them, and that has real-world consequences. The concept of normal in human terms is a significant contributor to the polarised social divides across the world right now. People on all sides of the debate, social, political, religious and even sometimes scientific, have allowed their cognitive bias to dictate what they consider to be normal. It starts wars, it helps populist politicians get elected, it ends careers and it starts violence in the streets. Autistic people are only abnormal in your eyes if you have decided or allowed yourself to be led into the belief that our characteristics are not part of the variety of life and experience, but deficient. If you accept that people who think carefully before making decisions need to explain things thoroughly, sense the world acutely and feel emotions intensely even if they don't show it, are just part of human variety, then we would be part of your concept of normal. If you feel the need to say that we are not normal, then you are making the unequivocal point that you do not accept our validity, our value or our humanity. As the world progresses through the inevitable consequences of the coronavirus pandemic, there is much talk of what we are to expect of the new normal. There's never been a better opportunity for us all to challenge the way we use the words normal and abnormal. Perhaps the new normal should include abandoning the word to refer to people altogether. Thank you for watching.